there, Luke 17, verse 5, the Bible reads, And the apostles said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. The title of the sermon this morning is Increase Our Faith. Now I'm going to warn you, all right, t- today's sermon is going to be controversial. There's at least two things here that, you know, you're not going to hear in the average church, okay? Let alone, you know, I mean, I mean, you might not even hear them in your average Baptist church, okay? There are some things here that Jesus preaches about, all right, but he will be negligent of me as your pastor. it will be negligent of me as a Bible preacher to avoid these things or to sugarcoat these things, all right? We have the Bible. These are the words of Jesus Christ. So if you're going to get mad at anyone, get mad at Jesus. All right? I'm just a messenger of Jesus Christ. Let's pick it up from verse number 1, Luke 17, verse 1. Then said he unto the disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. So here, Jesus Christ just in our face is telling us that it is impossible that offenses won't come. Meaning that as Bible-believing Christians, as people that aren't only saved but followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, as people that stand on the Word of God, Jesus guarantees us that offenses will come. People will come and try to offend you. People will come and persecute you for the stand that you take on the Word of God. And especially in 2019, maybe 50 years ago, you could preach this book without compromise, without any kind of uh, persecution. But in 2019, you preach the words of Jesus Christ, persecution will come, all right? But don't get offended by it, okay? Jesus Christ has warned us. It's on its way. It's coming, all right? Let's keep reading verse number two. It were better for him, for whom? For the person that brings those offenses, right? That a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Let me just start off by saying, those are the words of Jesus Christ, He's saying it's better for those that offend God's people, especially little children, all right? And we see little children being taken advantage of, all right, in some churches, you know, sexually exploited even in some churches, all right, by by pedophiles and by just wicked people. Jesus Christ makes it very clear that it'd be better if there was just a millstone hanging around his neck. That, that's, that's a, if you don't know what that is, that's a stone that is used to grind uh, um, like a, a grain. Okay, it's a big stone. Jesus, these are Jesus' words. It's better if they just, just put that around their neck, throw that person into the sea. Just, 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 uh, just better to kill that person off. All right? Meaning, okay, meaning that those that get away with that kind of behavior, it's going to be worse for them on the day of judgment. It'd be better if they were just cast into the sea so they wouldn't just continue, um, you know, uh, building up the wrath of God, the judgment of God upon them. It's going to be worse for them on the day of judgment when they are actually cast into the lake of fire and the punishment that they're going to receive for being one of these that offend Jesus Christ, the children of God, all right? Now, that should give you assurance. That should give you comfort, knowing full well that the wicked who, who uh, offend us, the wicked that persecute us, you know, they might in this world, in this life, get away with it as, it's, as it be, but they're not going to get away with it when God deals with it, all right? God will always make sure that justice will be served even in an unjust society that we live in. Let's keep reading. Verse number three. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. So moving on to the topic now of brother, you know, brethren, Christian brethren that offend one another. All right. Now, let's touch on, I've preached on this before, but let's touch on this very quickly. If we have brethren in the church that offend you, that, 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 that uh, sin against you, that trespass against you, okay? It's not, you know, the command is here, what does Jesus Christ command? Rebuke him, okay? If someone has offended you, okay, and it's bothered you, it's a sin against you, go and rebuke that person. Go and show that person they're wrong. Go and criticize their actions. Tell them, hey, you have offended me, okay? This is a problem. We need to fix it. Verse number, let's keep reading. And if he repents, forgive him. Right? Jesus wants it to be the case that if brethren offend one another, that there would be forgiveness. Okay? He commands the rebuke. He says if that person then repents, then forgive him. But I want you to notice there that the Bible does not teach unconditional forgiveness. There's a condition there. If he repents, forgive him. All right? Meaning that if someone does not repent, you call them out for the sin they've committed against you, but they're like, 
you know what? I don't care. It's not my problem. I'm not going to repent from that. You know, in that case, you don't have to forgive the brethren. Okay, it's conditional there, based on the repentance. We'll keep seeing that. Uh, actually, before we keep reading, what I do want to say though is is something very clear. Okay. I believe we should strive to do everything we can to forgive one another. Okay? I do. Okay? But if someone does not repent, you don't have to forgive them. Okay? But, warning. Warning. Forgiveness plays two purposes. Okay? Number one is that the offended party knows that they've been pardoned. Okay? They know, okay, this person is no longer holding this against me. That's part of the forgiveness process. The other part of the forgiveness process is that it would come off your shoulders, that you wouldn't grow in bitterness toward that person. All right? So this is what you've got to be careful of. If someone has not repented, you're not required to forgive them, but you've got to be careful that the bitterness does not grow in your life. You've got to be able to forgive yourself, as it were. You've got to be able to let it go on your side so you don't grow in bitterness. Okay? Because it's going to happen. You're going to be like, why hasn't this person repented? You know, and you're going to get angry. You're going to get more bitter. You might be like, well, I'm just not going to go to church anymore. I don't want to, I don't want to have, you know, I don't want to see that person anymore. You get to the point where bitterness grows in your life. You know, be careful of that. You need to make sure that part of it is let go, but you haven't necessarily given that person the pardon because they've not yet repented. All right. Be careful when it comes to not forgiving someone. Make sure that it doesn't allow bitterness to creep into your life. Let's keep reading verse number four. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. All right? If someone has done you wrong and they repent, they say, sorry. What's the next command? Thou shalt forgive him. Okay? If someone said sorry, you can't just be like, well, I don't accept your apology. No, you've got to accept it. That's the command of Jesus Christ. All right? Notice that it's the example that Jesus gives is someone wronging you seven times in a day. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think I've ever been wronged by anybody. You know, a brother, let alone an unbeliever, seven times in a day. All right? Maybe once, maybe twice. I don't think beyond that, right? Uh, But Jesus Christ is asking a huge thing from us. I mean, how many of you, like if I just came and, and, and told you, you know, you're an idiot, right? And then I, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Please forgive me. But then I said it seven times. How many of you would honestly say, you know what? I'm going to forgive him seven times. I think it'd be hard. <laughs> I think, I mean, I think that'd be really, really difficult. Hey, but that's the standard that Jesus Christ gives. Okay. Jesus Christ wants us to be people that are able to forgive. And then we'll look at verse number five. And the apostles said unto the Lord, increase our faith. <laughs> They're like, we can't do this, God. If someone offends us seven times in a day, I don't think we can forgive them seven times in a day, Lord. Increase our faith. And that is what you're going to need. Okay. In order for you to be able to be the kind of forgiving person that God wants you to be, you are going to have to go to Jesus Christ and say, please increase our faith. Please give me the ability, God. It's got to come from him. It's not something that's going to come from your flesh. It's not something that's going to come naturally from you. you, You're going to have to seek the Lord to give you that ability, to give you the power uh, and and the forgiven heart you need. And you need to ask God to increase your faith. What we're going to see throughout this whole chapter, um, I've titled it Increase Our Faith for a Reason, because there's a lot in this chapter that you're going to need your faith increased in. Okay? And remember, these these are the apostles. These are people that have done amazing miracles in the name of Jesus Christ. And even they are saying, we need our faith increased. All right. Let's keep reading verse number six. And the Lord said, if ye had faith as the grain of a mustard seed, ye might say unto this uh, sycamore tree, be thou plucked up by the roots and be thou planted in the sea and it should obey you. Now, when you read a verse like this in verse number six there, I, I used to read that and... Um, sort of wonder what's what's the point like if i had the faith like if i could actually have enough faith where i could actually move a tree into the sea is it into the sea yeah plant it into plant it into the sea what advantage is there what's the benefit of doing that number one number two i'm like if that were possible why don't we read anybody in the bible doing that 
Or why have I not seen any believers in my lifetime, you know, be able to cast a tree into the sea? You know, but the advantage, the thing is you've got, you got to do, now remember, the book of Luke is very thematic, okay? You've got to keep everything within the context of the chapter that you're reading in. And I, I came to realize, okay, this is not Jesus telling us we should be people that are trying to move trees into the ocean, okay? This ties into the whole forgiveness thing. This ties into all of that, what we just read before, all right? So if we keep it within the context, what Jesus is speaking of is a miracle in light of the ability to forgive. In other words, it is not normal. It is, in fact, impossible for a man to forgive their brethren seven times in a day. It requires a miracle, okay? And that's why Jesus Christ then takes a, the, the example of a miracle of casting a tree into the sea. Because it is miraculous. If you are someone that is able to forgive a brother seven times in a day, it requires that miracle from God. That's why it requires our faith to be increased, all right? It's only possible with faith in God. It is, not impos- it, is, it is impossible for you to be able to do that without the Lord God. All right? it requires, in fact, Jesus Christ says it requires the, the, a faith the size of a grain of a mustard seed. It doesn't require even all that much, but it does require us to have our faith in God in order to be able to forgive our brethren. And if you say to me, you know, I've got a brother who, who has repented, who has apologized, but I just can't forgive them, okay? Maybe verbally I've forgiven them, but I just haven't been able to forgive them in my heart. Then you need to say, I need a miracle. I need that faith, the grain of a mustard seed. Lord, increase my faith. You need to take that to God. Otherwise, you're going to allow that bitterness in your heart to grow. And it's, it's just at some point, it's going to blow up into something else. Far greater than what the problem was originally. All right? Let's keep reading. Verse number seven. Now, as we read verse number 7, again, don't separate it from the context of what we're reading. Okay, it all, It's all the same thing. Verse number 7. But which of you having a servant plowing or feeding cattle will say unto him by and by, and he is come from the field, go and sit down to meat? And will not rather say unto him, make ready wherewith I may sup and gird thyself and serve me till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. So, What he's saying here, what Jesus is saying here is that you will not reward a servant, okay? A servant whose job is incomplete. Yes, they finish uh, plowing the ground. They finish doing whatever job they had out in the field. You know, you're not going to stop them and say, well, you you know, because his job hasn't been completed. He's still required then to go and to serve his master, to go and prepare the table so the master can eat. But you're not going to stop them halfway through their job and start rewarding them. Okay, let's keep reading. Verse number nine. What, what my point was there that he is expected to finish what is required of him, the servant. Okay, if you have an employee, if, if you, you know, if you're a manager, you have employees, you know, and, and they've got a job to do in a certain period of time, you're not going to stop them halfway through that job and start rewarding them. Okay, what's expected of them is to do the hours, to do the job that is required of them. Okay, verse number nine. Doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. That word trow not is basically, I think not. Okay? You're not going to thank the servant for just doing the things that were commanded of him. All right? I mean, you say, that's not very very nice, Jesus. What's going on there? Just think about your employment. Think about when you signed your contract to work. You know, your your, your employer said, hey, we're going to pay you X amount of dollars. You know, and you're required to do X amount of hours and you're required to do this job. That's the agreement. All right. Now, if you go to job to work and you just do the minimum, you just do what is expected of you, you shouldn't expect a thank you. Okay. I mean, your reward is the agreement, the X amount of dollars for doing that job. You know, <laughs> and I've had employees that have done their jobs and they're like, you never acknowledge what I've done. I'm like, what are you talking about? You got paid, didn't you? <laughs> I mean, if I held back your pay, then you could say, I haven't acknowledged you. You know, I'm not meeting the requirement, you know? And this is why, you know, some, some jobs have like employee of the month and they, they recognize certain employees. The whole point behind that is that that person has gone above and beyond what is expected of them. You know, they, they've, sh- they've shone brightly that month and so they're being recognized as the employee of the month. That's the purpose behind it. You're not going to give someone the employee of the month for just doing the job that was assigned to them and that was agreed to them, okay? So th- that's what Jesus Christ is teaching here. 
All right? Let's keep reading. Uh, verse number, number 10. So likewise ye... So now let's apply this to us as servants of, of God. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants... We have done that which was our duty to do. All right, so you don't deserve any gratitude for simply doing what is expected of you. All right, now the application to this is the, the, the forgiveness. Again, what we just spoke about, about the brethren. All right, now if someone has done you wrong, you've rebuked them, they've repented, it's your duty to forgive them. Okay, you don't just get you don't just get praise. Wow, you forgave them. You're such a great person. You forgave them. Wow, you deserve all this extra, you know, praise and whatever. No, it's your duty to forgive your brethren who have wronged you. Okay, that's what it's teaching here. Us as servants of God. Now, not only that, but you might do a task. Okay, that you think is thankless, especially in the church. You might do a, a, a service in the church. You might do something and nobody thanks you for it, okay? And you might be tempted to say, and you know, we're all tempted to do this because we all have the flesh, you know, and we all have pride, you know, and every, everyone likes to be recognized for, you know, doing things. That's just sort of part of the human makeup that makes us, you know, failed creatures, all right? But you might be tempted to say, hey, I'm not being thanked for this job and get angry about it, get bitter about it, but look at what Jesus Christ said in verse number 10. We should say to ourselves, when we've done a thankless job, we should just say to ourselves, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. It's the right approach. You know, if you're not being thanked for something in this life, you know the principle. We've already read this. Just be humble, okay? Just lower yourself in the sight of man, and God will exalt you in due time. We covered that in Luke 14, wasn't it? I think it was Luke 14. We covered that, you know, to, to be humble and God will exalt you. The other thing that we recognize as believers is that we may do many thankless tasks on this earth, but God watches what we're doing. If we're doing it to serve Him, if we're doing it to serve Jesus Christ, we put Him the first in our life, then God will reward you, okay? You're laying up treasures in heaven. That's where it's going to be for all eternity. That's where you're going to be forever, okay? Enjoying the rewards. You're going to be thanking God, man, it was so good that I went unthanked for that job because I've earned these rewards in heaven. Praise God. You know, just having the right perspective in life is important. Let's keep reading. Verse number 11. And it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem um, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Now, we're about to read um, the story of the ten lepers. All right, I don't really have too much to say in this story, but again, think of Luke as a thematic book. I keep saying this. Because it just seems like when you read the book of Luke, these, these um, random stories come out of nowhere. All right? But we already saw what it means to be an unthanked servant. All right? We see that actually apply to Jesus Christ in the next story. All right? let's, keep, let's look at it there. Verse number, uh, verse number 12. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. So, that, you know, they're standing far away from the crowd because they don't want to contaminate other people with leprosy. And they lift up, lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Hey, they recognized that it was Jesus Christ that would heal them. They had heard about the great works of, of Jesus Christ and they came to him seeking his mercy. Verse 14, and when he saw them, he said unto them, go show yourselves unto the priests and it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. All right, so uh, I'm going to quickly read to you from Leviticus 14, verse 2. It says, This shall be the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought unto the priest, and the priest shall go forth out of the camp, and the priest shall look, and behold, if the plague of leprosy be healed in the leper. So I want to point your attention to verse number 14, is that we see that Jesus Christ is keeping law, the law of Moses. Okay, he's, he's operating under the Old Testament law. And so we see that he's someone, yeah, absolutely, that's someone that fulfills the law of God. But in Leviticus 14, verse 2, it's about a leper who believes they're clean, who believes they're cleansed, and then they're to go to the, to the priest and show themselves and get that publicly acknowledged, as it were. Okay? It's a little bit different here with what Jesus Christ says to him in verse 14. He doesn't heal them on the spot. 
Like many times when Jesus Christ heals, um, he does it on the spot. He does it immediately. This time, he says to, the, to them, go show yourselves unto the priests. Go to the priests. And then it says, and it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. All right? So Jesus Christ did not heal them immediately, but it was their faith on the words of Jesus Christ. Go show yourselves to the priests. They might be wondering to themselves, why are we going to the priests? We still have leprosy. If Jesus Christ did heal us, then we should go to the priest and show ourselves. But they're journeying their way to the priest as they have leprosy. Okay, That required a great amount of faith. A faith that what Jesus Christ had said would come to pass. All right, And as they're doing that, as they're on their way to see the priest, then they're healed. Okay, They had listened to the words of God, they had believed Jesus Christ, they had put their faith in what he had said, and that's what cleansed them. Praise God. Let's keep reading, verse 15. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. That's our lesson, guys. When God comes and answers our prayers, when he heals us from our sicknesses, when he gives us our every need, it's our responsibility to go and glorify God, to give him thanks. Verse number 16. And fell down on his face at his feet. Hey, this is a position of worship. It's come to Jesus Christ. We know we're not to worship men. It seems to me that he recognizes this is God in the flesh. He comes down and worships with him. His face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. I would assume the other nine were Jews, you know, were, were, were Israelites. And this was the point, the fact that he would have to uh, tell us that this was a Samaritan that had done these things. And Jesus answering said, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Uh, there are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, arise, go thy way. Thy faith, had, uh, thy faith hath made thee whole all right so we see what is it that healed him from his sickness it was his faith on the lord jesus christ so he says your faith hath made thee whole but we also know the other nine were made whole we know the other nine were healed that means it was their faith as well in jesus christ they were healed i believe at this point if they weren't saved at this this is the point that they were not only say are healed physically but healed spiritually they had believed on jesus christ and they were saved but let me say this, I think this gives us an idea of how often we fail to thank God in our lives. Okay? We might pray about 10 different things for God to answer. You know, he answers the one and we praise him and we thank him for the one. You know, there might be nine other things in our life that we've just not thanked God about. I think that that's, that's maybe realistic, maybe that's the way it is, you know. Um, so please be, be mindful, guys. And by the way, you know, let's tie it into what we read. The, 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 the servant that feels they have not been thanked. You know, we see this play out. You know, again, just, just take, taking you back to that. You know, if, if you've served the church, you've served other, other brethren, and you feel like, man, I, I've, I've not been thanked in this job. Well, you're not the only one. Even Jesus Christ, you know, did great works and was left unthanked. In fact, Jesus Christ may have done great works in your life, and you have not thanked him for the answer prayer and the blessings that he's given you. So let's be people that aren't only praying and bringing our supplications to God, and we need to do that. We need to bring our requests before God in prayer. But when those prayers are answered, we should highlight those things, right? Let's try to put that into practice, you know, especially on Wednesday nights when we pray together as a church and I ask for prayer requests. Please use that opportunity as well for praise points, you know, for, for, um, to, to um, mention answered prayers. So we can thank God for those answered prayers. So let's not be thankless like these other lepers were, the other nine lepers were. All right, let's keep reading. Verse number 20. Now, in verse number 20 is where things sort of change um, direction from the rest of the chapter. And th these are the controversial passages here. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, stop there for a minute. The Pharisees are demanding things of Jesus Christ. That just shows you they don't respect his authority. They don't respect him as a teacher of God, as, as a prophet, as, as God in the flesh. 
They're demanding of Jesus to answer their questions. What do they ask him? When the kingdom of God should come. And he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Now think about what we learned back in Luke 13. All right, about the kingdom of God coming in three phases. If Jesus says that the kingdom of God cometh not with observation, that means it's something that you don't see with your physical eye, what phase of the kingdom do you think is Jesus referring to here? You know, the, the phase where you enter into the kingdom by being born again, or the phase when Jesus Christ comes to establish his millennial kingdom, or the phase when Christ, Jesus Christ gives that kingdom unto the Father in the new heavens and the new earth. Which of those would it be applicable to this situation? It'd be the first one, right? The first one, when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because everything that takes place as, you, as that new man is able to enter into the kingdom, it's without observation. It's something that takes place inside the heart of man, okay? Inside the man. It's not something that can be seen. I can't see your salvation. I, I can't see that you've you know, physically entered the kingdom of God. But if you have... Uh, the profession of faith that you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, that you've trusted His death, burial, and resurrection, and it's, it's without the works of the law, then I know that your new man has entered into the kingdom of God. All right? That's the application here. Look at verse 21. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. That's what the kingdom of God is. It's within you. Now, let me just say this. We know that these Pharisees are not believers of Jesus Christ. Okay, Jesus is not telling them you're saved, okay, because the kingdom of God is within you. He's telling them that you're looking for the kingdom in the wrong areas. You know, you're looking for this physical kingdom, which is fine, but first of all, if you're looking for the kingdom, you've got to look for it within yourself. You know, are you saved? Have you received the king of the kingdom or not? You know, and if you've done that, if you are saved, if you have received Christ, you have entered into the kingdom. The kingdom of God is literally within you, okay? Spiritually within you. Let's keep reading, verse number 22. And he said unto the disciples. So that's what he said to the Pharisees. Now he's speaking to his disciples in verse 22. The days will come when ye shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. All right, let's stop there. What we know by these days when we compare Scripture with Scripture, I haven't got time to go through it all now, is that Jesus Christ here is talking of the tribulation period. Okay, that, that final period to come when the Antichrist is, is raised and he persecutes Christians. All right? Jesus Christ says, The days will come when ye shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. So there's coming a time when you're going to have this great desire to see the Son of Man, to see Jesus Christ. Okay, now you say, well... I desire to see him today. Well, praise God. You know, I think hopefully we all desire to see Jesus Christ, to be with him forever. But there's a coming a day when you're really going to desire that. Okay? And that desire is going to come when you're being persecuted in, in the last days. All right? In the days of the tribulation, when there's persecution against the saints. And I think that's why verse number one starts with, you know, the offenses. The offenses will come. Okay? Let's keep reading. Verse number 20, 23. And they shall say to you, see here or see there, go not after them, nor follow them. So you're going to be desiring, I want to see Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, you know, please come back. You know, the, the, these are the days that I'm longing to see your return. I'm longing for you to deliver me from this persecution. And there's going to be some, there's going to be great um, uh, deception in the last days where some people are going to say, he's come, come here with me. Go there with me and I'll show you that Jesus Christ has come. There's going to be a lot of end times deception. Jesus says, don't listen to them. Don't go after them. Don't follow them. Hey, Jesus Christ's return is not a secret. It's not going to be just a few people that realize Jesus Christ has come. All right? There is no secret rapture. There is a rapture. There is a resurrection. But it's not a secret. Okay? Let's keep reading verse number 24. For as lightning that lighteneth out of the, at one part under heaven shineth unto the other part of heaven, so shall the Son of Man be in His day. That's how obvious His coming is going to be. 
If you ever looked out, you know, in, in a thunderstorm and you've seen lightning, you know, you might recognize as, as you see lightning, it starts in one area and just quickly it zaps across or, or down. And for a brief period, you see the light travel, but for a brief period, you see the whole thing, right? You see it from there, from the, from the beginning all the way to the end before it disappears, okay? It, it, that's how obvious, that's how you're going to be able to see the Son of Man come. It's not going to be something that's secret. It's going to be seen by everyone. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7 says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierce him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Jesus Christ says that every man will see his coming. It's not a secret. Okay? Just like lightning that shines from one part of heaven to the other part. And by the way, this is how I believe how every eye will see him, okay? Because, you know, if Jesus Christ is just descending in one area of the earth, not every eye is going to see him. It's just those people that can see him on that side of the earth. And then you've got your flat earthers. I say, well, this explains the flat earth. <laughs> because if the earth is flat, then everyone will be able to see him when he comes down. And that, that fails on so many levels because, I mean, how big does Jesus have to be in order for the whole world to see him, like if it's flat? I mean, I would say the sun's pretty big, all right? And not even the whole world can see the sun at one point in time, okay? Only half of the world can see it while the other half is in darkness. So how big does Jesus actually have to be? Well, I think it gets answered in here. In another passage, it says, as lightning shines from the east to the west. You know, it, it, my understanding of all that is that when Jesus Christ comes, he's going to travel the entire globe, okay? That's how I see it. That, that's how I understand how people will see him, how every eye shall see him, all right? Verse 25. But first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. So before the end times, before his coming and establishing the physical kingdom on this earth, before he pours out his wrath on this earth, he says he must first suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. That's Jesus Christ speaking, obviously, of his death, okay? Being, being put to death, uh, for the sins of the world. And then verse number 26. And this is when it starts to get controversial. And as it was in the days of Noah, that's Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day of Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. So let's understand this. He says, it's going to be like the days of Noah, what in particular, that they're going about life in general. They're eating, they're drinking, they're getting married. They're going about life as per usual, okay? And then as, as Noah entered into the ark, sorry, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, the flood came and destroyed them all. He's saying that in the day that Noah entered into the ark, or if we, as, as, as people that believe in the rapture, the day that we're delivered, that we're raptured, that we're resurrected with Christ, will be the same day that God brings destruction. It'll be the same day. But notice, everyone's going about life as per usual, eating, drinking, getting married. Now, as someone who used to believe in the pre-trib rapture, this was one of the passages that really bothered me. Okay, it really bothered me. Number one, because if this verse is about the pre-trib rapture, God is saying that on the same day that we're raptured, He's going to destroy the earth. He's going to pour out his wrath, as we know, okay? But that's not the pre-trib position. The pre-trib position, by and large, is we get raptured and there's peace for three and a half years, all right? There's no destruction really going on. I mean, do you guys know what I'm talking about? I'm not, you, know, you know what I'm talking about, right? So that, that bothered me. But then you have other pre-trib teachers that will say, and rightly so, this is not about a pre-trib rapture. But I would disagree with them that, you know, it is about the rapture. But, you know, obviously I, 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 I agree with them that it's not about a pre-trib rapture. All right, and they'll say this is about Jesus Christ coming at the end of the seven years. You know, at the end of the seven years. Then, that, that's, you know, so it's, it's, it's for the tribulation saints or it's for the Jews. It's not for us. It's not for us, they'll say. But that bothered me as well because I'm thinking at the end of the seven years, God has poured out his seven trumpets, the seven vials of his wrath, I mean, the sea has turned to blood. There's been all this hail. There's been these locusts from hell tormenting people. And I'm expected to think people are just going about life, eating and drinking and getting married. 
Well, that's crazy. That's not what the Bible teaches. So, so these are passages like that that just bothered me. I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. You know, and, and I used to just say, I'm just dumb. I can't work it out. But this is perfectly compatible with a post-trib pre-raph rapture. I say, why is that? Because if you remember, one of the, um, one of the uh, uh, seals that gets opened up, the six seals, is like hyperinflation. It's like because of the wars, because of the famines, it's like money has totally lost its value. You know, and pe people just can't, you know, the economy just collapses. You know, it, it costs so much money just to buy a measure of, 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 uh, of meal, a measure of wheat or whatever it was, you know. And so we see what the Antichrist does when he raises himself into power. He brings in the mark of the beast. That's the new world currency. And it says you can only buy and sell if you take the mark of the beast. So the Antichrist actually gets the economy back running around, across the world by introducing the mark of the beast. So by doing that, you know, people then are eating and drinking. They're able to buy and sell and they're back to life. It's like, cool, it's all been sorted. They finally say it's peace and safety and sudden destruction come upon them. So it makes sense at that point, right? That people think, oh, we're back to normal. And then the rapture takes place. And on the same day, God pours out his wrath. But let's look at the days of Noah. Let's take a look. Go to Genesis chapter 7. Keep your finger in Luke 17. Let's go to uh, Genesis chapter 7, verse 13. What is significant about the days of Noah? Not just the destruction. Verse 13. And in the selfsame day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. So Noah and his three sons, his wife and their three wives. Verse 14. They and every beast after his kind, and all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and every fowl after his kind, every bird of every sort. And they went in unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And they that went in went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him. And the Lord shut him in. Notice verse number 16. How did they come in? Male and female of all flesh. Of humans and of every animal. Okay? Male and female of all flesh. Notice it doesn't say male and male. Notice it doesn't say female and female. Homosexuals did not go on the ark. All right? The ark of God was for male and female of every flesh. Okay, and here's where the controversy is. Because you've got the homosexuals obviously outside of the ark saying, let us in. Hey, it's not for you. All right, it's not for you. And look, I, I make no excuses, but if, if homosexuals are not allowed on the ark, they're not allowed in this church either. And it's not because, uh, you know, I'm this horrible, wicked man. It's the standard of God. If we're going to stand on the word of God, then listen, I'd rather just get the persecution and, and, and not fail my God. All right? I want to stand on the word of God. Whatever persecution may come, as long as I stand on the word of God, then I, I know I'm right. And I know they're not hating me necessarily, but they're hating the words of God. Say, so why are you bringing that up? Is that really what it's about? Well, let's keep reading. Go back to Luke chapter, Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, verse 28. Luke 17, verse 28. Likewise also, these are the words of Jesus. All right? Don't come to me afterwards and say, why did you read that in the Bible? These are the words of Jesus Christ. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot. What's the story of Lot? Remember, he went into Sodom. And what was Sodom known for? Their wickedness, one particular, the homosexuality. Okay, they were reprobates. They had rejected God and God had rejected them. And we know what happened to the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. All right, we, we know why God poured out his wrath on them. Let's keep reading, sorry. Uh, verse, what did I read? Verse 28 again. Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built, and they, they, they went around about life as per usual. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. 
How does God feel about homosexuality? How does he feel about sodomites? First of all, he's not going to deliver them from any destruction and God's going to wipe them out. All right? And, and unfortunately, as a society, I can't believe it. I remember just as a, as a child in the 80s, everybody knew that was a sin. Everybody knew that was unnatural. It was, it was you know, unusual. It was, it was weird. Everybody knew that, right? It wasn't something you could, you could say that and nobody would think, oh, man, there's something wrong with you. What's wrong with you? No. But just, what am I now? 37. Just 30 years later, okay, things have changed. People have moved away from the Word of God, okay? There's less people going to church. There's less people preaching what the Bible, the Word of God says, and it's changed society. It doesn't surprise me. When the pastors get away from the Word of God, so will the, you know, the rest of the nation. They've turned their backs against the Word of God, all right? God came and rained fire and brimstone, hell, literally hell fire, okay, on the earth before they even went into hell. They were suffering with the, with the fire and the torment that God brought upon them. Verse 30, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So, look, is it a surprise that homosexuality is being well received you know, today, is it, is it a surprise that our public school system are telling our children, hey, you might not be a boy, you might be a girl. You know, you don't, you know, you don't have to be attracted to a girl. You might, you know, you might find yourself attracted to a boy. You don't know. You know, don't limit yourselves. Should that surprise us that that's going on? When Jesus Christ has warned us in verse 30, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Hey, listen. This, these kinds of sexual sins, this kind of perversion, this kind of wickedness is just going to increase into the last days, all right? But Jesus Christ warned us, okay? Jesus Christ has warned us, but he's also told us, don't worry, you're going in the ark, or we're going to be raptured, you'll be taken out, and then destruction will come upon them on the same day that you're removed. Let's go to verse number 31. And in that day... So in the day of, of tribulation, guys, he shall be upon the housetop and his, uh, and his stuff in the house. Sorry, let me read that again. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. So when persecution comes, Jesus says, look, it's time for you to flee. It's time for you to go. It's not time for you to start getting all your resources you know, stopping by your house and getting the things you need. No, it's time to go. And say, so, does that apply to us? Yes and no. The primary application to this is to those that are in Judea, those that are in Israel, okay? And I'll just read to you very quickly from Matthew 24, verse 16. You can turn there if you want. You're not too far away. Matthew 24, verse 16. Matthew 24, verse 16. The Bible reads, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. So there is a coming a time when the people of God that are in Judea, that are in Israel, when the persecution comes, they are to flee into the mountains, the Bible says. That, you know, God commands them, don't come back home and collect your things. And I, and I think if we're the final generation of Christians and we go through this time period, I think we can take that application for, our, for us. Obviously, the persecution in Judea is going to be much greater because that's where the Antichrist is going to set, up, set himself up and, and, and claim to be God. And I, I don't know how much of that persecution is going to reach our shores, Australia. Praise God we live in a nation that's pretty far away from all the drama that goes on in the rest of the world. But still, if it comes our way, I believe the principle is there that we are to flee okay, and, and not go back and try to look after our own bodies, right? You say, why are we fleeing? We're fleeing. Ultimately, the purpose is that God will drive us to areas where people need to hear the gospel, okay? We're not fleeing because we're afraid and we're fearful. and No, no, we're going in power. We're going in the Spirit of God. We've got the words of God. We've got the gospel. You know, it's our opportunity. It's our last chance to get out to different places, to different cities, to different areas, find people that need to hear the gospel. It's the last chance to earn rewards in heaven. It's our last chance to, to do this beautiful work that God has given us and see souls saved. That's how we need to go. 
you know, in, in the spirit of power that God gives us. So I don't know if I can do that. Well, that's why you've got to go to God and say, God, increase my faith. Increase our faith. You know, in, in the face of persecution, can I do that? You know, increase your faith. You say, I, I want to go back home. Though. I want to go back and get my clothes and get my, you know, get, get whatever I have, the resources. Look, if, if, if God commands you to flee, then flee. You know, that means God's going to provide your needs. Okay, God's going to provide for you. Verse number 32. Let's look at this. The verse, the memory verse. Remember Lot's wife. If we're the final generation, guys, during the tribulation days, we need to remember Lot's wife. So let's remember her. Let's go to Genesis 19. Keep your finger there in Luke 17, but go to Genesis 19, verse 15. Genesis 19, verse 15. The Bible reads, and when the morning arose, this is obviously the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, guys, uh, of Lot and Lot's wife. And when the morning arose, then the angels hasted, uh, hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, does Lot seem like the kind of guy that wants to leave the city? No, he lingers. The men, these are the angels, laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters. The Lord being merciful unto him and they brought him forth and set him without the city or outside the city. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, that, yeah, that he said, escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. You can see that's a type of the, the, um, the believers in Judea being told to flee into the mountains. You know, when that happens. Lest thou be consumed. You know, but look, verse number 17, the instruction is clear. Look not behind thee. Don't worry about what God is doing. He's going to unleash his wrath, the fire and brimstone upon that wicked city. Don't look back. You don't have any sympathy for what's going on. Don't feel sorry. Don't think, man, God, you're being too harsh. God, that's my city. What are you doing? No, just go. Just flee. Verse 24, Genesis 19, verse 24. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife, uh, this makes me sad, you know, it makes me sad for Lot. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. Hey, she suffered the, 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 um, the wrath of God. She wasn't even in the city, okay? But she looked back. She had sympathy for those that were being destroyed. Hey, these were wicked reprobates. You know, God's judgment came down upon them, and she looks back. Obviously, it's not, it's not the, the physical looking back that's the problem. It's a heart issue, okay? That, that she had a problem with what God was doing to that, to that wicked generation. And if, if you say to me right now, oh, Pastor Kevin, I can't believe you said that about homosexuals. Hey, remember Lot's wife. They deserve the destruction that God is going to send their way. Don't look back. Okay? God knows what he's doing. Trust his judgment. Trust his righteousness. Start renewing your mind so you understand why is God so angry? Why, why, is, this, why, is, this, why is he doing such a, an, uh, you know, a, a great punishment upon these people? If you don't understand that, you're not in tune with the word of God. You're not, you're not in tune with his righteousness. That's why God tells us, Jesus Christ tells us, remember Lot's wife. Okay? You don't want to be destroyed because you have sympathy against those that hate God. All right? So I don't know if I can do that. Ask Jesus to incre increase your faith. Increase our faith. Verse 33. Back to Luke 17, sorry. Luke 17, verse 33. Sorry if it's a bit of a long sermon. There's, there's a lot to cover. Uh, I'm near the end now. Verse 33. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. 
keep it in the context of what we're reading, okay? If we're the last generation and we're like, man, I need to, I need to, uh, you know, get all my, all my gear, all my food, and I, I need to, I need to save my life as it will in this last days, you know, you lose it. Okay, now, just a, an, an analogy for this, like, obviously, I'm flying down to Sydney every week, and I keep hearing the safety instructions, you know, you know, how to put on your seatbelt, how to put on your safety vest, all that kind of stuff. But um, also, they, they tell you to read the, the, the safety card, I guess they call it, you know, and it basically says, look, in the case of an emergency, if, if, the, if the plane is to land, you know, on the sea or something like that, you know, you, you don't take your, your bags with you, you don't take your things with you, you know. And you say, well, why is that? I want to take my things. It's because when that happens and, and it's time to, to leave the, 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 the aircraft, if you're trying to get your bags and you're trying to get all your things, you're going to slow down the evacuation process. Okay? You might be trying to get all this stuff because you need it. Oh, man, my phone, my wallet, I need all these things. You know, where is it? Open your bags. And by the time you finish doing that, you know, the plane might be underwater. It might be too late for you. Okay? So this is the teaching here. If we're that final generation, we don't need to worry about all those things, all right? We should have the attitude of the second part of verse 33, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. Hey, that's an amazing promise. If we say, I need to get out of here, you know, and you take your Bible with you, or better yet, you should have memorized enough scripture so you can preach the gospel without it, if you don't have it, all right? Get out there. You don't need to take everything with you, all right? And the Bible says that if, if you go with the thought that you might lose your life, his life, shall, uh, his life shall preserve it. God gives a promise to those that realize, hey, I might lose my life, but I'm going to live for him anyway. I'm going to do what he says, and Jesus says he'll preserve it. Okay, so which, who are the, which believers are going to lose their lives during the tribulation period? Those that seek to save their lives. Hey, which believers are going to preserve their lives and see it through? Those that seek you know, I'm, I'm willing to lose my life for Jesus Christ. You know, it's, it's a great teaching there. And uh, I was talking to some, a brother that said to me, and I, I know where he's coming from because um, if you guys are familiar with Peter Ruckman, these are the, the Ruckmanite, uh, these are the Ruckmanite um, uh, arguments that are made against a post-trib pre raph rapture. But the idea is, but, you know, if we're that final generation and the only way we can buy and sell is by taking the mark of the beast, you know, I, I, you know, as a father, and, and I see my children hungry and, and, you know, going without, isn't the temptation there to take the mark of the beast, you know, so you could at least provide for your family, you know? And uh, I'm, I've heard that argument, like, so many times. And every time I've heard it, it's because of the influence of Ruckmanism. Okay, that's one of their arguments. So if you've thought about that, you know, let me just say this. Psalm 37 verse 25 says this, I have been young and now am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. What's the promise of God? That if we're righteous, okay, if we seek to be righteous people of God, serving him faithfully, willing to lose our lives even, then your seed, your children will not be in a position where they're begging for bread. God will provide for them, Amen. all right? Supernaturally, maybe. I don't know. But God's going to make sure that it's dealt with, that your seed don't go hungry. If that's the case, you wouldn't even have the temptation of thinking, do I take the mark of the beast? You know, it's not even going to happen. And then, I, you know, I say to, what I say to these people, not only do I quote that verse, but then I say to them, how many Christians in the Bible do you see when they're under persecution, they just give in? And be like, yep, I worship the devil. <laughs> well, I mean, look, you got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That, knowing that they're going to lose their lives, they're like, all right, just throw us into the fire. If, if God saves us, we'll be saved. If he doesn't, we'll just perish. All right? When it comes to persecution for believers, there's a working of the Holy Ghost. Don't, yes, I know you're weak in your flesh, but don't forget you also have the new man. Don't forget the kingdom of God is within you. Okay, the Holy Spirit can take that new man, empower you, give you boldness to speak for him, to stand up for God. That's what we see play out in history when believers are being persecuted, when believers are, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, are confronted with the loss of life. You know, they stand up for Christ. They stand up for God. 
It's not going to happen. All right? 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I glo- rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then am I strong. He says, look, the tribulation period, yeah, is going to make you weak in your flesh. But then you'll be strong. You'll be strong in the spirit. You'll be strong in the new man. Look, you're not going to be tempted, you know, to take the mark of the beast as a believer. It's not going to happen. All right? And, um, and the other thing I say to them, where in the Bible does it say that believers are being tempted to take the mark of the beast? Where in the Bible does it say that believers are taking the mark of the beast? You know, don't build your doctrine on what the Bible doesn't say. Build it on what it says. If it doesn't say that, then why are you worried about something the Bible doesn't even say? Okay, we have enough of the Bible that tells us we're going to be strong in persecution and that God will never let our seed beg for bread, you know, for, the, for, for His righteous people. Don't worry about it. Are you back in Luke 17? Sorry if I've taken you away. Luke 17, verse 34. And we'll just wrap it up here. It says, I tell you that in that night there shall be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken and the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken and the other left. Two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? So let me just stop there for a minute. There are some crazy teachings on this that basically say those that are taken are being taken by God to be destroyed. Okay, just just crazy. But look, those that are, look look at the question by the by the uh, apostles, and they answered, or the disciples, and they answered and said unto him, "Where, Lord? What do you think they're referring to? If someone says where, you think they're asking about the ones that stayed or the ones that have been taken? I mean, common sense would be those that have been taken. Where, Lord? Where are they being taken? And he said unto them, Whithersoever the body is." Thither will the eagles be gathered together. Let's understand that, okay? Jesus Christ explains it in a sort of a picture form. Okay, so you have eagles, verse number 37, eagles. Okay, they're birds of prey, aren't they? Okay, Jesus is saying, look, wherever that body is, wherever that, that, you know, that carcass is, you know, the eagles, the birds of prey will be gathered together to, to partake of that. And he, he pictures that, okay? Now, I'm just going to read to you from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. You know, one of the most famous pas- uh, raptor passages, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. And you guys know it says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The picture there that Jesus Christ has given us is that we're going to be like those eagles that just gather for that mule, okay, to, to go to that body. And what Jesus Christ, what we know about the rapture, is that his believers are going to be caught up into the air to be with the Lord. The Lord is, that, as it were, that body. And we being that eagle is taking flight and go into that body. That's the, that's the picture that Jesus Christ has given us here. And um, I'm looking forward. I don't know about you guys, but I'm looking forward to the day when I can lay my eyes on Jesus Christ. Okay? And you might say, I really want to make it to the rapture. Everyone's going to make it to the rapture. All right? Even if you lose your life before that, you're going to go up first, okay? You, you get the benefits of going first, okay? You'll be reunited with your dead body, resurrected body, you know, sinless body. You're going to go up first, and you're going to see Jesus Christ with your physical body. What, what a glorious day. All right, let's pray.